this way. Hi, everybody. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so as we're transitioning into the final panel, we're going to take a look at um, sort of the way Susie had prefaced it, um, a new avenue in which you can explore playwriting. Um, today we have Seth Potterman moderating the panel, um, and we have um, three people representing two different groups of um, radio playwriting. And Seth, if you'd like to take a look. Yeah, right. sure. Hi everybody, um, I'm Seth Potterman, I'm the manager of online media at the Dramatist Guild. Next to me is Claudia Catania, who is the host and producer of Playing On Air, which I just have to tell you, I'm a huge fan, and I re recently got into it, and I put them up there on my iPod, and I listen to them on the, on the way to work, so I'm a huge fan. And then we have Sheila Cowley, who is the, hold on, hold on, operations manager and writer and operations manager at WMNF in Tampa. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Can you help me memorize the WMNF? And then uh, Matt Cowley, who is a writer and sound designer at the Radio Theater Project and at Studio at 620. Okay, I was trying to flip my notes. I did okay. Uh, can I open up with just a general, uh, what, what drew you into wanting to produce radio plays? I work at a radio station. <laughs> uh, about 16 years ago, uh, I started a radio theater troupe there. Because uh, so I was a writer and didn't really have experience writing scripts, so I wanted to try it. And so we, kind of, we went to the Midwest Radio Theater Workshop, which is now the National Audio Theater Festival, so I learned about that. Could you be able to talk about the logistics of it? Um, and I would just, I, I think I would just start by saying, you know, Nobody's talking about slamming doors and Trevor Maggie and Molly and anything. You know, this is all new work. It's it's modern. It's not recreations of nostalgic stuff, but it's all new writing. And uh, you know, it's relevant. It's not weird. It's it's just another mechanism. You know, it's another outlet for, for new playwriting. I think the genesis for me was a, a little different. Um, and I think there's room for a huge amount of writing and playwriting to go on to radio stations and podcasts and streaming and, and whatnot. But, but my niche, what I do and what uh, compelled me to do this was it bothered me that uh, we live in a big nation and the vast majority of us do not know a thing about theater. You know, they, maybe they've been to their nephew's uh, high school performance or an occasional uh, outing, but for the most part, I've done unscientific research and I've asked people if they can name a living playwright, and maybe they'll come up with an Albi or Kirchner, but maybe not. So I thought this is a this is appalling because we have a, a treasure, you know, treasure of playwrights, and a nation that really doesn't understand very much about theater. Um, so I, one day I was sitting at a reading in New York, you know, one of a multitude of readings, and once again a bunch of actors and playwrights, you know, blew my socks off, and I thought, why is it just eight of us on folding chairs listening to this person blow our socks off? Why not the nation? Same amount of time, why not? So I decided, um, there's a big waste, I don't like waste, I'm aversion to waste, and there's all that talent in New York. So I also thought if we could somehow, you know, create a platform that's essentially a stage as, you know, as large as airways can go, and as ubiquitous as the internet, um, maybe more Americans would start to understand what theater's about, and as a result, become, you know, patrons. And you know, in terms of audience development, this might be a long-term way to um, to gain support for theater as a whole. So uh, it seemed the way to, to get into most people's lives was either through radio or the internet, and that the way to do it, at least in my estimation, was through the short play genre because people are on the go and they're used to cons you know, consuming those particular old and new forms of technology in short spurts, which is perfect for the short play, uh, whether it's you know, six minutes or 26 minutes, 
it's still the amount of time they're used to consuming theater, music, discussions, whatever, uh, on technology. And, and it's a genre that I think is magnificent and has tremendous potential, um, but is unexploited. So it seemed like a perfect, a perfect thing. And given there's no money, there's no way you could really compete for it. You know. Anything but something languishing in somebody's uh, hard drive or, or drawer. And, and that's how, so that's how it happened. So I just decided to do it. And um, the first person I called was Chris Durang, and he was really nice, and he said yes. And uh, then Alexandra Thurston said yes, and Jackie Weinfeld said yes, and it was enough yeses to put together a demo to take to a radio station, and, and that's how the ball got, got rolling. So it's two different approaches. So it's very different. different. Yeah, you're doing studio work that you're distributing. We're doing, yeah. we've done a lot of studio work and, and stuff that we've distributed at <laughs> other stations, but what we've been focusing on the most probably is live performances. Could you, so, could you both kind of talk about your process of, of producing? Because it is, it is a little different. Can you talk about what goes in behind the scenes and how you put this all together? Sure. So um, what we do uh, for the past five years, part of this project is uh, called the Radio Theater Project. And it started out as a collaboration between an art space and St. Petersburg, a studio at 620, uh, which is a great little incubator art space for all kinds of things. And they say the answer is always yes. So there's theater and music and dance and anything else, and uh, our radio station, WMNF, which is a community listener-supported kind of station. Um, and uh, there's kind of a group of people there. We live in St. Pete, so there's a lot of retirees. Um, and some of them in the, in the community there are kind of have had long and storied theater careers, for instance, but are not acting actively anymore. So this was a way for them to uh, kind of create opportunities for themselves. Uh, so what we do is uh, once a month, for about six months out of the year, we do a live show. And it's um, usually three plays, two to three to four uh, plays uh, acted in front of mics. And then there's a table of sound effects and things. Um, and uh, we have about a day's rehearsal. Um, come up and do, a, you know, they do a read through. And then we do a tech rehearsal in front of the mic with sound effects. And then just put it up the next day. So it's a very short commitment for the actors. Um, I do a little bit of kind of pre-production sound effect stuff that weekend or whatever the weeks before. It's a Monday night, so right. a lot of the actors have, are in current shows, but you know the theaters are dark on Monday, so we get really good actors who are free on that night. Right. So and we just re we record those shows and then broadcast them later on the radio station. Yeah. And we got uh, a couple. It, it's the, the audience is built slowly, but now it's kind of standing room only. Uh, it was helped uh, a couple years ago when we got a grant from the Florida Humanities Council to always include a Florida writer in the show. And because of the grant, it had to be free, so a lot of people started coming. But the last year, we haven't had the grant, and it's just been, you know, make a donation at the door, and it's done really, really well, you know, and, and it's gotten even more popular. Uh, and I would just say, you don't have to have a radio station to do that. You know, we have a radio station with a bunch of microphones on this. You've got a studio. <coughs> it's the kind of thing, if you don't have a radio station, it's, it's, you can still put work up with actors, you know, reading scripts on mic for an audience with sound effects. You can record it if you want or not. I mean, there's a group in New York that sell out multiple evenings of shows, of this, you know, the same show, multiple performances, and they don't even try to record it. They just, they're doing it just for the house audience. And things changed for us, because we first were doing it to focus on the recording, and then we realized more people are in this theater than are probably listening to this show on the radio. <laughs> 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 you know, the whole focus has just on the house sound, and you know, we've kind of, uh, I know you have kind of subtle sound effects, and we kind of ramped up to sound effects because, and made it a little more prominent. And I use manual sound effects more yeah, than recorded. Right. I, uh, we started doing the radio theater in the studio, so I did all the sound effects on the computer later, kind of as a post-production sound kind of process thing. But we discovered that people just love watching me open and close doors and walk on things. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. So, yeah. As much of that stuff as I can do manually, that's just part of the show now. So. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought, I'm so glad that you threw that in because I I don't want to assume that everyone knows what a sound designer does. But I would, I mean, if you can elaborate a little bit of your process, uh, and then we'll go into what playing on air is and how it's different. But sure. I'm, I, I just, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what it is. Sure. 
So the, the short answer is it's anything but the voices on a radio play. Um, you know, if it, on a film, it's a whole different thing working with other stuff. But uh, for us, it's just anything but the voices. But the kind of slightly longer answer is that um, the cool thing about radio for me is, like I think Steve said yesterday, that uh, in a film, if you have you know, Poland 1945, it has to look like Poland 1945. But on the stage, you can put a sign and people will buy into it. On the radio, you can say it's Poland 1945 and have a little bit of wind, or you can say, isn't the submarine great and have a little ping sound? And in the listener's mind, they will see the complete set. You know, they'll see Das Boot in front of them, even though you haven't you know, built it. Um, so what I do kind of as a sound designer and Foley guy thing is kind of just push them in that direction. I give them just enough sound other than the voices to say, okay, this is really where this is. It grounds it a little bit. So if they're in a diner, I might clink some glasses. So it just makes it feel a little bit more realistic. Uh, if there's a fight, you know, I, I have a little uh, leather jacket filled with pillows that I fight with. Um, or if it's, you know, something that I can't do manually, there might be a battle sound, and that's computer on the computer. And it's just anything that pushes the audience to be their own cinematographer, you know. I would just say, as a corollary to that, uh, I know one thing that Steve Yaki said, if he's here, is really, I can never write for radio because my stuff is so visual, but I think, oh, that's the huge freeing thing of radio because you can do stuff on the radio and create these visuals that you could never do on stage and that, you know, maybe you'll never get a chance to do on film and television, but you can really do it easily on the radio. I was just mentioning The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, or Galaxy, um, which was this huge, beautiful world on the radio. And then a TV and film was just like a real letdown, you know. <laughs> but it was written originally for radio. That's what it was created for. And something like that you can do. Uh, I think one of your famous first ones was Carnival in My Pocket. Do that on stage, you know. But you can do it on radio. Yeah, it's so, a lot of fun. And I can attest to the um, entertainment value of Matt's sound. Because I was at a table with him, and he was doing the sound effects for your uh, show. was playing it. It was great. Um, and also, when Michael was talking earlier today about uh, animals and this and the other, and it is true, you know, we did a, a war and light piece called The Final Interrogation of Ceausescu Chau's Dog, um, the Romanian dictator's dog, and it asked no played the dog. And it was, I think, for the listener, a lot more fun than, you know, because they could add their imagination, and that happens in a lot of the plays. Um, someone mentioned Jackie. Rheingold earlier too, and and she has a, a wonderful um, fervent and whimsical, delightful um, sensibility. So she can write a play about a twelve foot guy sitting on an airplane next to a two inch lady, and on the radio, no problem. <laughs> is is there something that you that really attracts you to a script that you're like this fit this will fit really well, or this will not fit very well? Um, yeah, I suppose. I mean, I'm since this is more about theater on the radio than radio plays, per se, you know, I look for a well-made play. Um, guess, like, <clears throat> that would be the first thing that would attract me. Um, and, and I guess the last thing that would attract me, too. I mean, it's basically that. It's just a good play. There are certain things that I know won't work, even if I adore the play. Right. Um, if it's highly physical, or highly, highly visual, or it has an FCC infraction every second word, um, you know, those, those, that can be problematic. Um, but little adjustments, I mean, I've, I've actually been quite amazed myself um, how little has to be done to a stage play to make it work on radio, and quite wonderfully, you know, yes, if there's, you know, five fuckings and two shits, that's generally not a big deal. And every playwright has a different way of, you know, dealing with it. But to, to a person, they've all said, oh, no, no, no problem, no problem. And they either cut it, or they come up with something even funnier, instead of, um, or they just, you know, all right, I can't say fuck, I'll say screw, I can't say shit, I'll say crap. You know, whatever they decide to do, it's usually quite inventive and easy and fast. Sometimes, you know, there's a missing visual, um, and playwright is, you know, just, okay, 
You have a gun, you know, and you're, you're done. It's, you're well, it's all settled. Um, almost always the playwright's on site. So very often, last minute, you know, they'll say, oh, no, no. And, and they'll just rewrite a little something, and it, it's, it's wonderful to watch them work because they just make a slight adjustment and it just kind of reshapes the whole, the whole moment. Um, so we've been fortunate. Is there something that, as, your, as, as writers, is there something that you're, you have in your head that is, this is what we have to do? I noticed on your website that you accept submissions. We do, I, was, I guess you accept submissions too. We, we both do. And we, we do. Uh, <laughs> but I noticed, I noticed that you have like a list of like, keep this in mind. Yeah, well, there, and that's a good point because uh, we've had a different experience with the Banking Stage Plays uh, and some spectacular and infamous failures that live in people's horrifying memories of. Uh, Stage plays that people didn't loud of people, stage plays that people didn't want to change anything. It's where we run into trouble because we a lot of stage plays work fine on the radio. It's all about dialogue, uh, and where we've had problems is somebody said, oh it was it was produced already you know it's a fully play it was produced it's fine just like it is you know I don't need to change anything. And what we found is that that's it's a whole different medium. Yeah, and that's a really that's that's an approach that we differ a little bit from people like Claudia, where she's putting a stage play on the air. And our what we try to do is make radio plays. So that's a different medium. Uh, and so uh, when I'm writing for that, what I try to do is take advantage of things that um, are specific to that medium. So things that you can only do with sound, or things that are enhanced by the use of sound, or uh, things, that, uh, uh, things that have not worked have been things that are visual, obviously, or kind of, uh, you're asking a lot for people to kind of sit and listen for a long time. So length is an issue, and uh, there has to be something really compelling. So just like any other stage play, story is, you know, key. And uh, it has to be, there has to be enough action, even if it's two guys talking in a bar, uh, to use the frequent analogy. Um, there has to be something to keep the action going, to keep them listening. But um, so things that I've tried to do are you know, just anything that's. There's a, a example I think of visually, like in the silent movies. Uh, um, there's scenes in like Charlie Chaplin where he's walking down a train track and there's a train behind him and he doesn't hear it because it's a silent movie and so you know he just keeps walking. Or there's a crowd behind him with signs and things and he doesn't notice because it's silent. Um, and you can do that kind of thing on the radio, kind of in the inverse. You can, um, uh, uh, um, and I'm suddenly drawing a blank because people are staring at me, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, things that you don't uh, uh, see, you can take advantage of the fact that you can't see it and kind of reveal it later, or things like That's that. That's true. Um, things that only work because people can't actually see what's happening. Right. You know, it's a beautiful um, use of radio. So I've, I've written little sort of things that are on walkie-talkies or people talking on the phone or you know anything that is kind of a way that might not work on stage very well but works because it's a sound thing. But I think you asked about the, me the mechanics of it and you know some of the simple mechanics are people have to talk or they disappear. You can't have people standing around in the background of a radio scene because they're just not there. So, right. So mm -hmm. there's oh uh, the fewer people that are in a scene. The easier it is on listeners. Uh, two or three, four people. You know, once you get beyond that, it starts becoming a little chaotic for people listening. And and it, there's, we don't, there's not as much of this if you're focusing on people watching. You know, but on the radio, if it's truly on the radio, there's only so many people you can tell part really at the same time, which is the old kind of classic. Uh, you know, there's on the radio guy, there's an Irish guy, there's a Jewish guy, a, a German guy. You know, they're all so you can tell their accent apart. A Russian guy. So you can differentiate casting actors from their tone of voice. You can't have people that sound identical, or they, it's like you've got the same person, like you've got twins on stage. Mm -hmm. YouTube, but, I'm sorry, it, no, 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 just to say that I find YouTube's very helpful because you can't quite remember an actor's <laughs> register. It can refresh your memory, but I've made mistakes nonetheless. Well, one of the things, it's, it's really free. Yeah, it's really free because doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter what you look like, you, you know, you'd never get cast in that part visually maybe, but it doesn't matter because it all is what you sound like. And so you can have, you know, people in your 70s playing beautiful young women, it's, it's how they sound, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how tall you are, you know, so actors really love it. 
Um, do you have questions? <coughs> I'm curious in your situation if you mic your audience so that you're they become a part of that process. Yeah, and, and, and um, uh, I think Sheila talked with Nan Barnett who had a brilliant idea. They did some live stuff where they had the audience do some of the Foley effects. You know, they drop, called cue cards. Right, which I think is great. But um, we do have a house mic sitting up to catch the reactions and things because if you're listening to the live, uh, to, to the broadcast later of the live show, that makes it just come to life a little bit better. And clearly we're going to steal Nan's idea. Right. She said I could. Although one quick horror story that we saw a, a a uh, science fiction, the science uh, sci-fi channel used to do uh, radio plays for a while on their website, and they did a live show of uh, Dial In for Murder and another play. And um, at the end of the other play, I think it was, they were in this field and this tension was just building and building. It was really scary. And finally, the guy at the end did end the other guy with a, a shovel to the head, basically, right? Um, so uh, there's this big scene building up and building up, and the Foley guy doing everything live, has a big watermelon, and the shovel to the head is, boom, I'm smashing a watermelon. So if you're listening on the radio, that's a really scary moment until the crowd in the theater <laughs> sees <laughs> Gallagher, right? And hey, so the, the crowd laughing. erupts in laughter. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's, <laughs> a, that's, <laughs> a, that's, that's terrible. Keep that <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If any of you are in New York, we've also started to do it occasionally in front of live audiences and I don't know I don't think we have time but I did bring um, a sample if we do have time. Oh good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Audio no, for sure. the videos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, we should do that. And um, I would just say if you're doing it yourself, you know, actors are fantastic to work with on mic. There's basics of mic stuff and we have a, a incredibly intricate handout that we neglected to print out that we can email or you, you can email the people it has a lot of resources for people that are doing it live now. Like Ira over there, who we just met, who's getting paid to write radio drama. You've got, what, like 70,000 subscribers to your podcast? The True Truth Podcast? I just write it. That's a ridiculous <laughs> podcast. It's another good podcast, I have to say. Yeah, it's you know? cool. The Truth Podcast. Yeah. It's cool. So, <laughs> you 70,000 people in the, in the crowd. If you, yeah. if you divide that by 10,000, that's how many we have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a, there's a tremendous potential for this sort of work that you're doing. And I think more and more people will do it because for a long time, you know, the days, the glory days of radio were over and they were just vanquished by television and film. But now everyone is constantly plugged in. So there's a huge need for content. Uh, so I, I, I do think there's potential there. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, sure. Do, you, are, do you guys have to work with AFTRA or? I work with SAG AFTRA, yeah. SAG AFTRA. And what about you guys? We don't because we basically have no budget. Um, and our, I don't, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but we have a couple of SAG AFTRA people in there. And equity. And, and equity people. Um, we've never had a problem. Our audience is small enough and the there's pay is low enough. It's basically gas money. So maybe that's what the cutoff is. I don't know. You know and they're reading too. So mm -hmm. many okay. times if you're holding the script, they only have to pay for transportation. I guess that's good. Gee, I should tell that to SAG-AFTRA. <laughs> <laughs> this is like equity, equity. Uh, that's uh, exactly the type of question I was going to ask, getting more toward whether you have any written agreements or licensing with the actors or with the playwrights to do this, considering that I'm assuming it's recorded for maybe future rebroadcasts. What do you do about licensing or rights? Me, me? Everybody. <laughs> um, in terms of the actors, it's negotiated by the union and it's favored nation, meaning everybody gets the same and the whatever back end is the same and what's paid into, you know, health and retirement. It's just otherwise, I think I would, you know, commit Harry Kari or all of course. So that's done. <laughs> Um, and then it's just a question of whether the actor wants, wants to do it. Um, for the writers, again, it's essentially, it's essentially favored nations. Again, I'm a one-man band here, and, um, it, it, you know, again, it, it pretty much it is what it is. There's a flat fee, there's um, a sharing in 
the revenue, other than we should be so lucky to think of other forms of revenue um, other than radio broadcast. I thought, you know, going into this, that there would be income of, you know, some support from what, what are called carrying charges. It's what the public radio state. But when you're an independent radio producer and you're starting, and the, the program director or the chairman of the thing says, oh, yeah, we'll air you, but we won't pay you anything, uh, it's, you, know, you have to weigh, do I want another 400,000 people, or do I want $26? You know, so it's, you know, what are you going to do? I, once you're successful, it's a whole other thing. And you have leverage. For us, what we do in the studio uh, is typically stuff that we write or friends of ours write, and our actors are friends of ours, basically. Uh, and for the live shows, uh, we do take submissions, and uh, um, I, yeah, there's a um, there's an agreement with the writer, and part of that agreement is just understanding that it's going to be podcast and broadcast live and things like that. Yeah. And they get a small stipend. They get a small stipend. Some people have flown, which flow from California to come to the show. Yeah. But the nice thing is that you know we're recording it for broadcasting, so you actually get a permanent record of your play and uh, a link on the website to the podcast that you can share with all your family and friends. You know, here's this is my play. This is what it sounds like. For our actors, um, it's mainly, mainly a core ensemble, and but it's all we don't. We're not blessed to live in New York like Claudia, so uh, for the most part, our names are smaller. Not to comment on their talent, which is great, but their names are not as big, so uh, they're mostly from our neighborhood. <laughs> so the the contractual stuff is smaller. And we're also under the umbrella of a couple of nonprofit groups who can't live, of course. Yeah. Um, both of you, I think, mentioned about length of piece. What's the average length of a piece? Is it, you said short play, is it around 10 minutes? The average is between 10 and 20 minutes. 10 and 20. That doesn't mean there are any exceptions. For us, um, we found for the live shows, uh, we've done some that are like an hour and a half, and uh, those are really hard to keep an audience in place for. Uh, an ideal length for us is like two half hour plays and then a 10 minute play, um, or something like that. With an intermission. With an intermission, yeah. Uh, we've done with with it kind of depends on what your target is like uh, there's a lot of people producing podcasts now which is great and so that's can be really variable you can kind of it's just what the story demands uh, if you're aiming for radio broadcast there are specific time links like you're shooting for 53 minutes right. yeah I mean um, to, to answer you I have to come in at a hard 53 minutes so that means if I'm going to have two interviews and two plays, or three interviews and three plays, you know, you have to, when you start to program, not only do you want it to be uh, thematically, you have some sort of thematic contextual sense, but it also has to fit together in terms of minutes. And then on top of that, there's an episode intro and an episode uh, credits, and then there's a play intro and credits for each of the two or three little plays, and then there's an interview after each of the two little, two, three little plays, and then there's music composed for each of the two, three little plays, and, was, and then sound design. But what has worked uh, also well for us has been uh, playwrights who have taken you know, full length plays and adapted them for radio into basically two half hour episodes that, that run with an intermission in between. And some of the really, really great ones that we've done uh, have been that we did uh, Marcus Gardley just this last year. Um, as part of the rolling national career with the Lark um, uh, where we have some well runs throughout we have done uh, the last two years adaptations of his that were condensed down uh, and work because the, the whole full length stage play was just too much for a radio audience but you can kind of get the, the essence of it. Mm -hmm. I've also done a lot of really short plays on the radio like one to five minutes. I had a, for a while I was doing one of those a week for like two years which is a great, it was a great practice for me, um, and it's a great way to try out ideas. Um, and since it's radio, you can kind of do everything yourself, so it's a, it's, it's a great way of just making an opportunity for yourself. I would just say, if, if you're doing it yourself and you're working with actors, um, and actors are fantastic, if, if they're stage actors, you may have to tone them down a little bit on them, so they don't just blow you into the next room. Because um, the mic is very intimate, but you know, what we found is, people that will act with their whole bodies, even though they're 
on microphone, your body affects your voice, you know. And if somebody just stands there and talks on the mic and doesn't ever move, it really affects their voice and they don't sound as alive as if they're, you know, really good voice actors uh, can move and still not be off the mic. And, and that's just something, you know, because you're working with people, to keep in mind, you know, it's okay to move. It's okay to shrink and raise your voice and, you know, all of those. And it's okay to vocalize too. Mm -hmm. Step out, whatever, because you mm -hmm. can't, as you said, you can't have those pauses, or people think they've lost power. So <laughs> some kind of uh, vocalization or sound effect to fill it in, if you must have it. But basically, Claire, it's been very good about you know letting it go, and you know if, if there's time to shift gears. There's a lot that can be done in post production, even when it's recorded live. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, we're going to see a little bit about uh, a little bit from each of um, these, um, of what they do. Uh, do you want to start with? with you? Sure, maybe then there'll be some questions. Are you going to do the video first? Yep, yeah, we're pulling it up right now. It takes a couple minutes to film on. Yeah. Um, where is this video from? Um, in March, we did two evenings of three short plays each at a fantastic new facility in downtown Brooklyn called Brick, Brick Arts House. Um, it's just adjacent to Bam uh, Harvey. And they have an, an amazing black box with bleachers that come out and a little U-shaped balcony. So if they're really every seat taken, they can get 200 to 30 people in there. Um, but they were terrific. The crew was terrific. Um, and we had a lot of fun. So it's a long story. Why we did this is because we are on nobody's radar. And um, a playwright said to me, David Ives, uh, Claudia, you know, you're never going to raise any money if you don't raise your profile. Um, so he said, call a meeting. And I did. I called a meeting. Uh, six playwrights showed up, and they all concluded that we had to do something live. So I said, but you know, that's going to cost a lot of money, and everybody just acted like they didn't hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, put it together. Uh, but they were right. They were right, uh, because it, it has helped, and I think we need to do it more. So this is one of those two nights. And then from the first night, I was able to cobble two of them together to make a show. From the second night, hopefully two. And then I still have some extras, because you always have hanging inventory. Sometimes it's there for these wonderful pieces could be stranded and orphaned for a year or two before you find an opportunity where they fit in thematically and uh, in terms of the, the minutes. Matt, are we good? Uh, <laughs> I, I do. I yes. have one. Just in terms of funding, I think when we had a conversation at one point, you guys have been able to get some funding from the state of Florida. The humanities. humanities. Yeah. That was great, right? That was great. So, yeah, they, that was done through the Studio at 620, that art space. And um, that was, to, it was for two years, and it was to fund plays either about Florida, basically, so they were, or by Floridians, or by Floridians uh, mm. preferably both. Um, and one thing that we found really works for us is locality. So even after the grant has ended, we have this kind of running series where there's a continuing story each time that's really, really hyper-local. It's based in that town, and there's, I co-write it with a former newspaper writer who's very funny, but he also adds in a lot of political references to people. Uh, and 
it's incredibly it's, popular. It's popular because people like to hear their town mentioned in the radio. I have a question. Um, have you experimented at all with um, times of day that you program your show and what is or isn't more or less successful? We have no control over that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought you were like, you know. No, I mean, the program director, the program director controls that. And we've been on the digital side channel for a couple of years. So uh, most people are either listening to the podcast or they're at the event. Most people are not listening to the actual live broadcast. I used well, that's to, a good question. The show used to be on the main broadcast channel on a Wednesday night or something, and now it's basically podcasted. Uh, we haven't really pursued promotion as aggressively as we should, which means basically at all. But um, uh, <laughs> it's you know it's it's difficult to it's listenership, I guess. So. Yeah. The focus has really been the live shows. Yeah. Yeah. The live shows are what get local pros. Can I ask? So, 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 um, neither of these these programs have have sought uh, uh, have have been, been put out as paid podcasts. This has all been either broadcast or offered free online. Yes, except I'm glad, I'm glad you brought this up because um, I'm you know knocking my brains out trying to figure out how to bring in a trickle um, of revenue and. The, the concept is to deliver theater to everybody for free and on demand. So that will remain. And there are some radio for free, and streaming for free, um, some podcast, you know, a few at a time for free. But it did occur to me that if we had a store where people could access shows that weren't available at that moment for free, let's say there's five shows up for free or five to ten, or for some reason they wanted to download it, I was thinking we should probably do that, and I wanted yes. to sort of ask what you thought you would, you know, would be a reasonable price to pay, because I'd like it to be inexpensive, but also... I'm going through the exact same thing, because yeah. I'm working on an audio project, and it's right. trying to figure out how to price it. <coughs> right, and, and also, you know, obviously there's nothing that would be uh, at the store couldn't be somehow gotten right. for free. Yes. But some people, you know, just convenience and uh, is worth paying something. Yeah, I, our podcast, The Dramatist Guild, are all free. Uh, I'm from the school that you don't pay for podcasts. Uh, money shouldn't come from the listener, it should come from sponsors. I just came across um, a lot of research about the pricing of how you want to do that and how you want to sell it. But um, there's even a few sites, and I can't cite any of them, but you can, you can put your podcast into it. And you don't even have to edit. They'll do all the editing and they'll cut in the sponsors that they think are more suited for your program. Wow. So, this is all via Google. I, I just don't have to. <laughs> are, are we ready for the video? Matt, are we good? Yeah. Yes. And also, you can always get it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not all on this. All right. Well, here is playing on air. Can you pause that for a second? Sounds not going to the right spot. Mm -hmm. John Box is in paramount. Wings paramount. My sexy boombox. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> now. <laughs> We should be. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
shows is, is being up there alone. It's, it's a weird kind of lonely environment. This is so much better. It's so much better to have stuff to bounce off people and have them to share. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a much more groovy thing. The one man show, I just love, I love the storytelling of a one man show more than anything, but, but it's a lonely racket. What made it especially fun, Bobby? I mean, you look like you were having a great time. But David's a really good playwright. He's really, I mean, he's a crafty playwright and like, I think he's, the play sort of masters the form. It's a short play. And within the short play, there are all these reveals. And that's really what makes it fun, you know? You know going in, it's a short play, and you're kind of wondering where it's gonna go, and it's unpredictable. And I think like all the little doors that are opened in the play make it for a fun experience. Um, uh, and so I like, I like that your expectations are kind of thrown off, you know? You think, you think a lot of things are gonna happen, and the opposite happens. You think they're gonna maybe connect, and they don't. And, and uh, that's that's why I like it, and you know, obviously, the, you know, the crowd, you know, it, it works. Get her. <laughs> Get her. She's good. Oh, nice. Did you want to? Come on. Come on. Yeah. No pressure. So, I think this is a 
good example of one of Matt's uh, that he wrote that takes advantage of the fact that you can't see what's going on. And I would certainly encourage everybody to write for radio and, and use it, you know, instead of a constraint. For, like, how could you, you know, just take advantage of that? Because you can do things you can't do on stage oh, or with sure. people or so anything. And create or incredible work. Genders are not specific. Just oh, I'll just do my best. Cool. Do, I, do we need one more actor? One more actor. One more actor? Come on up. So you'll be um, uh, Terry. And um, I will grab my extensive sound effects kit over here. He didn't break the door. Okay. <laughs> 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 Foley artist. <laughs> If you guys can hear okay, we won't bother with microphones or anything. Smells good. Right. With the summary. We're stopped by Publix this morning. The only direction I'll give you is the last line is kind of cut off by celery. Oh. That might be the best direction you've ever had. It was. Mm -hmm. uh, give me one second. I'm going to make a mess for the uh, epic house cleaning. Yeah, yeah. I, got, I got the first line, I know that one. Okay. Well, this is cozy. Yes. All tucked up like this. Yes. Shoulder to shoulder, as it were. Mm -hmm. It's actually fairly comfortable. Not bad. I mean, usually when I lie on my back like this, it's really uncomfortable. It hurts my lower back. But this isn't bad at all. That's good. It's padded just right, I think. Thoughtful of them. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Mm. It's a pleasant sound. If you close your eyes and listen, it is kind of nice. Relaxing in its way. Exactly. Like listening to the ocean at night. Or rain on a roof. A tin roof. Yeah, rain on a tin roof. I love that. One of life's great sounds. Indeed. You know what that <laughs> reminds me of? What's that? The Smithsonian. Really? Why? <laughs> Ever been? No. It's great. You should go. They have a pendulum there. This big weight on a long, long rope in the middle of the building. That's cool. It's really amazing. I don't remember what it was supposed to show you, but it looks cool. <laughs> Neat. Of course, strictly speaking, that's not a pendulum. No, it said so. I, I remember. Not the Smithsonian. Up, up there. Oh, right. Sure. <laughs> a pendulum moves in a bit of a circle, I think. That's more straight back and forth. True. <laughs> and, of course, the one at the Smithsonian doesn't have the big axe blade at the end. I don't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it came to a point and drew lines in the sand or something. Like ultimatums. No, just circles. Oh. <laughs> the other one in DC wasn't slowly lowering down either. No. <laughs> it was just in one place. And you didn't have to get tied to a bench to watch it. That's an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I mind being this close to you. Of course not. It's nice of you to say. Not at all. Still, it'd be nice to be able to move a little. Escape, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if it came up. Of course. <laughs> what do you think will happen when that lowers all the way down? Well, it'll cut us right in two, I should think. <laughs> that doesn't sound fun at all. No. That's the sort of thing that would kill a person. <laughs> I think that's the idea, actually. <clears throat> Evil geniuses can really be fairly unpleasant of a Sunday afternoon. To a spy, at least. Yes. Still comes with the job, I suppose. Absolutely. And it's been nice spending the afternoon tied up next to you. You mean that? I do. <laughs> I've always felt like there's been a distance between us, and I've never known how to cross it. <laughs> you wanted to? Yes, I did. I don't know what to say. It took a mad genius to bring us together. <laughs> life, is, life is funny, isn't it? Isn't it just? <laughs> well, I feel like I can die a happy man now. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a... <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh
uh, thank you guys so much. Um, and we can email the yes. fabulous resources for reading. And you'll, you'll be around for the rest of the festival. Yeah. Nice thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah.